All right. Let's dive into the Gulf Islands. We can leave some of these questions. So the Gulf Islands are beautiful and remarkably different from the San Juans. I've heard a lot of Americans describe these as the Canadian San Juans, and that's kind of a, an offensive term to Canadians, it turns out. They're the Gulf Islands, they're their own distinct thing. Um, and they're, they're bigger than the San Juans in geographic area, and they're much more diverse in terms of the number of communities. Uh, I really enjoy spending time in the Gulf Islands. Uh, there are lots of, of provincial marine parks to go to, a ton of different small communities to go to, uh, anchorages galore. You've got world, you've got Victoria, you know, BC, which is a, a world-class city. You've got Bouchard Gardens, you've got, and then really remote places like, like Wallace Island and Pirate's Cove. And so a mix of all sorts of different types of cruising just within the Gulf Islands. You know, on a typical trip up to Desolation Sound, you might only spend a day or two in the Gulf Islands, but realistically, you could spend a whole summer exploring the Gulf Islands and not get bored. So um, I'm going to run through here and talk about some of my favorite spots. And, and then um, if you guys have, if, if there are people on here who have cruised through there and have favorites that I haven't mentioned, chime in, um, because there are, there are so many places to see that I can't possibly talk about them all. So this is um, this this shows the basically the Gulf Islands, and you can see that this is the Strait of Georgia, um, where my cursor is. The San Juans are these little guys down here. To get over to the Gulf Islands, you've got to cross Haro Strait, um, and Haro Strait doesn't typically present much of a problem. There is a, a separate weather forecast zone for it um, for both the Canadians and the Americans. So so keep an eye on that, uh, and then you'll clear customs. Bedwell Harbor is in here. Um, that's that's kind of probably my recommended customs clearance spot for, for most people uh, who are coming up from the San Juans. Sydney um, is another good option uh, over this way. Most of the cruising through the Gulf Islands is really nice and protected. So once you're there, you don't have to, to worry too much about weather. Um, you know, if, if there was a bigger system coming through, that, that might not be the case. But in most summer conditions, um, you're pretty well sheltered through, through the bulk of the Gulf Islands. Uh, and really diverse, diverse cruising up there. Uh, we're going to, so you can see this red dot here that's denoting Bedwell Harbor. Um, and Bedwell Harbor has several options for moorage. You can anchor, um, you can use a, a buoy at the, the provincial park that's there. You pay a small fee for doing that. Uh, or you can tie up at Poets Cove, which is a, a beautiful uh, resort there with a swimming pool and, and restaurant and, and all that kind of stuff. And so that's an excellent, excellent option. Um, the customs dock is immediately adjacent to Poets Cove. And so you'll pull up, uh, this is the swimming pool. You'll pull up next to the, uh, maybe I have a, here's the customs dock. You'll, you'll pull up at this customs dock um, and clear customs, the, the customs office visible there uh, may or may not have people in it. And if there are people in it, you still go to the phones that are, are on the side of the building, go to the phones, follow their process and then the people may may confirm things. They ask that once you've cleared customs, you vacate the customs dock as quickly as possible and move over to either your buoy, your, your anchorage or the um, Poets Cove dock uh, and spend time there rather than at the customs dock. Another favorite stop is Montague Harbor. And there is a, a marina in here called the Montague Harbor Marina. But there's also, this is a large provincial park. And so there are uh, mooring buoys tons of room to anchor. If you're not familiar anchoring, uh, this is as good a spot as any to get familiar because it's, it's wide open um, and there is lots of room to swing. You don't need to be close to anybody, shallow uh, throughout plenty of it. So a really good option uh, for, for practicing your anchoring skills. And a fun thing at, at Montague is the Hummingbird Pub Bus. So you, you go ashore uh, at the, the public dock or at the marina, uh, and you can go up and either call or, or wait for the bus to come. Um, it's like summer camp for adults. Uh, this is a picture of the marina, but the, it's like a sing-along, very fun, festive uh, experience going to the, uh, the Hummingbird Pub riding the bus. Just got a question of, do you have to clear Canadian customs at each port? And that is no. When you clear in, you'll, uh, they'll ask you how long you're going to be in Canada. You'll give them the estimate. Um, and then you're, you're free to move about in Canada for the duration of your stay. 
without additional um, customs burdens. Montague Harbor, in addition to the bus, just has a lot of pretty scenery, beaches like this that you can, can walk on and explore. Uh, if you want to get off the boat and walk for a longer time, there are, are lots of roads to walk along as well. Just across from, uh, from Montague Harbor is Ganges, and Ganges is a, another um, really highlight destination. It might be my favorite single destination in the Gulf Islands. Um, there are a lot of really excellent restaurants. There's a superb farmer's market, um, a couple of private marinas in there. The one all the way at the, the head of the inlet um, was under construction last year, but should be open again this year. So there's also lots of room to anchor out. Uh, and we're gonna talk about anchoring here in a few minutes in more detail, uh, because that's something that, that nobody's born knowing how to do and, and causes a lot of anxiety. Uh, but once, once you get the hang of it, um, it's pretty liberating and, and a lot, opens up a lot of options that you, you wouldn't otherwise have. Here's an aerial view of Ganges. So you can see um, this marina was completely gone for, for last summer. Um, they were rebuilding it. This marina was in operation. This is uh, public docks here and here. Uh, and then you can see this big area to anchor in. When you're coming into Ganges and, and really, um, I highly recommend any time you're, you're approaching a, uh, an unfamiliar port, make sure you have uh, a chart plotter zoomed way in so that you see any isolated rocks. Uh, there are lots of, of, of rocks kind of on the way into Ganges. They're not on the direct path necessarily in, uh, but, but if you start to try to weave your way through um, and you're zoomed too far out on your chart plotter, you might miss them. So make sure you're zooming in um, to see all the obstacles. This is the, the farmer's market in Ganges. Reminded about the, uh, the excellent pub at the head of Ganges uh, inlet there. This is the view from the pub. Uh, this is the old marina. It hopefully will be a brand new marina this year. You can see you can rent mopeds on Salt Spring Island uh, and go touring on land. There are some wineries and artisan cheese makers and, and all sorts of stuff like that. Another favorite is Wallace Island. And if, um, if you're familiar with, with Susha Island and the San Juans, uh, I think Wallace Island uh, is, is awfully similar. And it's a great provincial park. There's lots of hiking trails. Um, there's a small dock in Conover Cove, uh, but mostly it's anchoring out here. And mostly you need to use a stern tie in the summer. It's just a pretty busy place, uh, but it's a, a worthwhile place. You've got these old, buildings on shore that cruisers have decorated with pieces of driftwood with their boat name and information written on it. This is kind of a traditional thing at many points uh, along not just this coast, but anywhere cruisers congregate throughout the world. Uh, and so you'll see uh, there's another one of these in Desolation Sound. Uh, near, um, and then there's another further north in, in uh, near a hot springs called Bishop Bay and elsewhere in the world as well. Beautiful scenery um, at Wallace Island. If you can get in there, um, by all means, I recommend it. This mystery old truck. I, I don't have time to um, talk at length about the history of any of these places, but there's tidbits buried in, in various cruising guides. And Wallace Island, for instance, was used at one point. Uh, somebody tried to build a, a kind of a high-end resort there. Similar thing happened up at, at Princess Louisa with Malibu Rapids, or Malibu Camp rather. Um, a lot of these places, somebody's tried to make a go of, of something that, that hasn't worked out. Um, and so this kind of thing is, is what's left over. Another uh, really worthwhile stop in the Gulf Islands is Ladysmith. Um, lots of room to anchor here again, or you can stay at, at one of the marinas. During peak summer season, I think that reservations a few days in advance will serve you well, especially if you've got a, one of the, the larger boats. As the boats get bigger, uh, marina space can become more challenging. So, uh, and particularly in July and August during peak time, that can sometimes be a, a challenge. So um, if you know where you're gonna be, make reservations. Uh, if you don't know, then, then you might call around to a few marinas and, and whichever one can accommodate you is the one that, uh, that you go to. But here's a, a picture of the gathering area um, at Ladysmith. 
Another provincial park that I really enjoy is Pirate's Cove. And this one is kind of difficult to get into. This is a range marker, a homemade range marker. You can see the arrow needs to point to the X. So right now the that we were not aligned on the range, but when those when the arrow points directly to the X, that means you're aligned on the range and, and on your way in, avoiding the, the rocks at the entrance. The holding in here is only fair, so make sure that if you're uh, anchoring overnight, the weather is either settled or you're, uh, you're well set. And now we're gonna talk about Dodd Narrows. Dodd Narrows is one of the more interesting and challenging places in the Gulf Islands. Um, it tends to back up a lot. There's, there, there's strong tidal currents that run through here. And so nine knots, it's similar to Deception Pass. This is a picture of us coming through uh, last year with a flotilla. And it's notable for a couple reasons. One, we're cheating the rapids a little bit. We're kind of, all these boats heading north are, are going faster because, uh, you know, you can see us throwing wakes because we're, we're battling a bit of current coming through. You can see this tugboat with a barge is waiting to go through. You can see the sailboat that's waiting to go through. Um, and you can see in here, it's not very wide. And so slack ends up, it's a bottleneck. It gets crowded at peak times. Um, and it's not uncommon for you to have to uh, kind of wait your turn or jockey for position. Now, ranger tugs and cutwaters are ideal for this because they're, they're relatively fast maneuverable and small compared to um, you know some of the, the the big cruising yachts so you have more flexibility to, to cheat and scoot off to the sides but generally speaking I think it's a good practice to arrive here you know within say half an hour of slack um, that's going to be your your safest option this is a, a picture of the ports and pass a page in ports and passes for Dodd Narrows is last year's book but the the information uh, is is the same, or is the same format, uh, rather. The information itself is, of course, different for different years. But what we have here um, is dates. It's pretty self-explanatory. So May 1st. Um, and then we have SLK means time of slack. Um, the max column is the, the maximum velocity, and the F-E is flutter ebb. And that shows the velocity and the direction. So a plus means it's a flood, a minus means it's an ebb. And so what this means uh, is at 2.33 in the morning, it's gonna be slack. At 5.50 a.m., it's gonna be ebbing at 5.6 knots. Then at 9.06 a.m., it's gonna be slack again. And at 12.01 p.m., it's gonna be flooding at 5.9 knots. So this is what we call, this slack here is a slack turn to flood. This is a slack turn to ebb. And we wanna be transiting near slack. Um, so, you know, if we were going through on May 1st, we, 9.06 a.m. is pretty early. Um, you know, you gotta have come from somewhere. So we likely would take the uh, the 3:22 p.m. That gets you into the Nimo, you know, by four or so, and that's pretty nice. A few things to keep out, uh, keep a particular eye out for in Dodd Narrows. Uh, log booms are a big problem. Many of those tugs and tows are not broadcasting AIS. So how do you know if they're coming? Um, well, listen on VHF 16. They'll make a security call. Uh, make sure you're listening though, and the volume's not turned down. Um, or you're, you're paying attention to other things. There is room for small boats to pass in here. So, you know, if you had a, a couple of rangers in there at the same time, um, or, or even, you know, a couple of 50 footers in there at the same time, it would be tight, but there, there's, there's room. The, the room problem is, a, is more pronounced um, when there's the, the tug and the tow coming through. Keep an eye out for logs as you come through here, especially if you're going fast because the, there's quite a bit of current running. Um, the logs can kind of pop out of the, the water unexpectedly. There's a, a log barge booming area on the north side of Dodd Narrows, and so there seems to be a lot of floating debris in the water um, often as we, we pass through there, so just keep that in mind. And uh, the Wacker Guide recommends that you, you make us security call on channel 16. I'm not a big fan of having all the 
small uh, recreational boats making secure take calls as we go through. I don't personally make a secure take call most of the time when I go through. I just think it clutters up um, VHF-16 too much. If you do want to make a secure take call, um, there are a couple of things. One, make sure that it's brief and you don't drag on and on. Um, you don't need to repeat everything three times. And two, uh, make sure you're using low power. So I'm going to turn my camera on for a second. Um, and I'm going to show you because I'm, I'm on my boat and I have my VHF here. I'm going to pull this up. There's a button on this particular VHF, and every VHF is different, um, but it's a high-low switch. And that switches the power, the transmit power, between 1 watt and 25 watts. 25 watts um, is high power, and that you'll make everybody in the whole Gulf Islands know that you're going through a deception pass, or in a Dodd Narrows. Not everybody in the Gulf Islands needs to know that, um, and it makes it so nobody else can use channel 16 while you're talking on there. So if you press the low power button, then the only people in your uh, little area, you know, close by, will know that, um, that you're, you're wanting to go through Dodd Narrows, only the people it's important that they know about it. Um, I want to clarify something with Gordon here, who just asked a question uh, about the timing. So that, that timing was taken out of Ports and Passes, um, this book that I mentioned before. Ports and Passes is adjusted for daylight savings time. So it, do not apply an hour correction to the times that you read in this book. Your chart plotter, um, I believe, will also be adjusted for daylight savings time or whatever time it's set to in, in the chart plotter. Um, if you buy the Canadian Hydrographic Services Tide book, it is not adjusted for day daylight savings time. There's no good reason to buy that book. Um, Ports and Passes doesn't really cost any more than buying the, the multiple areas that you'd likely need for the Canadian book. It's much easier to use and it's adjusted for daylight savings time. But make sure if you're using some source other than this, you know whether or not it's adjusted. The next question is, can you explain a secure take call? Uh, absolutely. A secure take call is uh, basically a, a notification to other mariners that there's something important. It's not, it's not um, as important as a, a pan pan or a mayday, um, but it's a heads up. This is, this is something you should know about. And so it's typically used for uh, large vessel movements, like cruise ships when they're coming and going, and they'll make a secure take call uh, because they're, they're constrained in their ability to maneuver and uh, they want other boats to stay out of their way. Um, or vessels, in this case, transiting rapids where there's limited space to pass, um, make a secure take call. A pon-pon call is something like um, your, your engine has died, but there's no immediate risk. You're just drifting happily. Um, and a mayday call is if there's a, a serious immediate um, risk to life or vessel, you know, fire, flooding, heart attack, something like that. If you aren't familiar with this book already, uh, another recommendation is Chapman's Piloting and Seamanship. That's a, a huge book, but it's got all the information on nautical traditions, what, what these things mean, um, and, and techniques for all sorts of things. So, so that's a, a good resource to have on board or at home. All right. So, Dodd Narrows, um, small fast boats, not a big deal, but, but larger, slower boats really need to be, be careful. Uh, which brings us up to the north end of the Gulf Islands and the Naimo. Um, the best moorage in the Naimo is the Naimo Port Authority, but that, that's gotten pretty busy over the years. And so we recommend reservations there in peak season. If you can't get in there, you do have other options. There's Newcastle Island, um, which you can either anchor at, tie up to a mooring buoy, or tie up at the dock. That's across, the, uh, that's over, over here, kind of. Um, you can't quite see it. But it's, it's just a short ride across uh, on an inexpensive walk-on ferry if you want to go into town, or if you have a larger dinghy, you can, can dinghy across. Um, there's some private marinas available as well. Waterfront Suites and Marina is one of them. But Gulf Islands, uh, in Nanaimo in the Gulf Islands is, is the biggest town short of Victoria. Um, and they've got everything. You've got full provisioning, you've got services, uh, and it's a great option for jumping off 
to uh, head across the strait or up the strait if you're heading up towards the Desolation Sound. Here are a few pictures of Nanaimo. Um, this is uh, Newcastle Island looking back at town. This is a view just across the Strait of Georgia from Newcastle Island. And so you can see uh, the view out on the strait really is helpful when you're deciding go or no go because you walk up the ramp, um, you look across and you can say, hey, it doesn't look so bad out there, we should go. Uh, and then you can hop across. And in, in some of these rangers and cutwaters now, your exposure in the Strait of Georgia is as little as, as you know, 45 minutes, uh, an hour as you scoot across. So you don't need a big weather window uh, for a, a jumping across. So that is it for the Gulf Islands. I think I wanna talk about a couple more places just briefly. And if anybody has favorite destinations, um, additionally that they wanna chime in on, go ahead and, and type them into Q&A. Um, but if you're spending more time in the Gulf Islands, some of the areas down uh, south towards Victoria are really cool. Like Bouchard Gardens is an incredible place. You can anchor nearby. There are mooring buoys at Bouchard Gardens. You can walk in. It's really neat to visit um, visit Bouchard Gardens so differently than, than most people do. And they have an incredible fireworks show. I think it's, you'd have to look for sure on the website, but it might be Saturday evenings in the summer. It's really worthwhile and I, I recommend um, and Victoria is a wonderful spot. The, the Causeway Floats um, docks are right at the base of the Empress Hotel. You, know, you pull in there, it's not particularly expensive. Um, it's not hard to get a, a, a slip there if you, you make reservations a little bit in advance. And you have the best seat in the house basically in Victoria um, to go do all the, the touristy stuff in Victoria and the comfort of your own boat to return to. Uh, so those are, those are some fun, um, kind of not traditional boating experiences, but I think things that, that really improve the overall cruising experience. Oh, I'm seeing a, a Thursday, mar uh, Thursday evening market, farmer's market in Nanaimo across from the Port Authority and a nice chandlery too. All right, so the Strait of Georgia, uh, it's big, right? It's 110 miles long, 20 miles wide. Uh, for a lot of us in the Northwest, it's the biggest water that we routinely navigate on. And so understandably, it requires lots of respect, uh, but it doesn't need to be feared. Most of the time, you're only out there for a few hours, especially in a fast boat. Um, you know, and this is a really good place to use, use your fast boat if you, if you have the speed. Um, there's no reason to be out in the Strait of Georgia um, wallowing along at slow speed waiting for the weather to get worse. Um, if you get out there, the weather's calm, I hit the throttle and get it done with because there's no guarantee it's gonna stay calm. Uh, but we'll talk through a bunch of techniques for, for maximizing your chances that you have a good crossing and, and how to look at the weather and so forth. And then we'll, um, I think we'll switch over to the internet here in a minute and I'll show you on my screen what I'd be looking at today if I were crossing uh, and if I'd go or not go today. So um, like most of these gates, the mornings tend to be calmer, but not always. And so we've seen people get in trouble by waking up with a good forecast and going when they would have been better served by waiting until later in the day. Uh, predict wind, wind finder, these uh, windy, these new, all these new uh, resources for looking at weather information show that, um, that trend throughout the day in more detail than, than previous um, kind of weather information that we had so you, you get a little more information. But don't just assume that mornings are gonna be calm as check the, the actual observed weather uh, before you head out onto the strait. We'll go through that. This was uh, the Strait of Georgia coming out uh, up to Vancouver at some point. I think this is right off Sandheads, flat as a pancake. Um, here was another trip across. This is a, a drone trip. Uh, the first summer I had a drone on board, I, I videotaped every one of the gates as I went to Alaska. Um, they pretty much all looked like this. Uh, and that was very much intentional. That was a, we sped up or slowed down so that we would get to these places um, when the weather is good. And, and you too can do that. And we'll, we'll talk about some strategies for that in a little bit. Uh, another picture, this is actually in January. I went up to Princess Louisa Inlet for New Year's and was coming home um, early January, about four o'clock in the afternoon, probably as the sun was setting and just flat as can be. So the point of all this is to show you that the Strait of Georgia does not have to be scary. It does not have to be rough. And, and I think most of the time, 
um, it's rough rather than, than scary. I mean, it's calm rather than rough and scary. So, so be respectful, but don't be scared. Um, and now we're gonna talk about how to, to build a complete weather picture of what's happening on the strait to make a good decision. I've mentioned this several times now that probably the biggest thing that we see, the biggest mistake we see people make with weather calls is to, to go entirely based on the forecast. Um, we have a lot of tools for looking at what the actual conditions are. And so the forecast is theoretical. Um, we want reality when we're making the, the decision about going or not going. And so for that, we have three big resources. We have, um, we have weather buoys, which here in, in the Strait of Georgia are Century Shoal and Halibut Bank. Um, we have light stations. These are Mary Island, Chrome Island, Entrance Island. And in Canada, those are manned light stations. There's somebody or a couple living in each of those. And every three hours, they give a report on the weather. Um, and that report is put online and it's also available on the continuous marine broadcast. Um, and finally, we're looking at the forecast. But the forecasts are kind of a, a distant third, I would say, to the uh, observed conditions on the day that we're actually going across. My minimums, uh, or maximums as it were, you know, calmer is always better. I don't like more than 25 knots of wind. And frankly, with a group, anything over 20 um, is, is getting into the, the, it might be kind of bumpy. But it also depends on where I'm going, where I'm coming from. Um, so if I'm running, say, from Nanaimo to Comox, uh, and I've got a southerly breeze, the weather's going to be behind me. It's not going to be rolling me the whole way across. That same day, if you went from Nanaimo uh, up towards Mary Island in this, towards Pender Harbor, um, you'd be rolling your way across the whole way. And so, so I might go um, on a day that was marginal. I might go with the weather, uh, that I, but I might not go across it or into it, if that makes sense. We'll talk about that a little bit more as well. The other thing to, to think about in the Strait of Georgia is the current. There's not a, a huge amount of current in here, but there's, there can be a knot or two at times. And so uh, the currents meet just south of Desolation Sound. And this is actually why you get that warm summer weather in Desolation Sound, water in, in Desolation Sound, because the, the currents converge there and there's not a lot of net flow. Uh, so the water just kind of sits on the surface and warms up all summer in that Desolation Sound area. Whereas north and south of Desolation Sound, the water is getting flushed uh, either north around Vancouver Island out to the Pacific or south through the Strait of Juan de Fuca and out to the Pacific. And that cold water then comes in on the flood um, and replaces the, the, the warm water. I wouldn't worry too much about this, except in the sense of um, if you had a big wind against current incident. Uh, so you, you, know, you were coming maybe south from Desolation Sound um, and the, the current is flooding and the uh, wind is blowing from the north. You know, you're gonna have the wind against current situation then, and that might be not so great. So don't, don't worry excessively about the current in the Strait of Georgia, uh, but do be aware of what's happening and try to avoid uh, any significant wind against current situation. This is called Malaspina Strait through here. Malaspina Spina Strait looks like it's more protected, but Malaspina Strait can still get pretty bumpy, um, particularly when you get the summer northerlies. That's kind of the northwesterly is the, the typical summer afternoon wind. And so if you're trying to come up the Sunshine Coast, for instance, um, in the afternoon in the summer, you may uh, find some pretty uncomfortable head seas, particularly uh, in this area, just a heads up. Coming out of Nanaimo, uh, so Nanaimo's in here, and this is an area called Whiskey Gulf, um, Pender Harbor up this way, Comox uh, up to the upper left in this northwest. And you've got this big area it's a torpedo test range. Some of the time, um, this is actually actively being used during the summer, uh, more likely during weekdays and more likely during kind of normal working hours, but it can be used at any time. Um, and you have to avoid it if they are actively using it. And so this can, if you're coming out of Nanaimo um, and you're heading to say Pender Harbor, your, your course would take you right through the middle of this. So it adds a fair bit of distance to go around uh, either way. If you do have to go around, um, you need to stay within a thousand yards oops, of, of these islands here, the Winchelsea Islands, the Bolinas Islands. 
stay close to them uh, and skirt around this area. It's charted, but it can be kind of hard to see in the charts unless, unless you zoom in uh, at the right level. And so, so I've highlighted it in this particular chart to make it obvious. They, they broadcast in the continuous marine broadcast, so the weather channels, whether or not it's open. But you can also call Canadian Coast Guard, their non-emergency emergency frequency is 83 Alpha. Um, don't call them on 16, or you can call Winchell Sea Control on VHF channel 10 to ask uh, if that is open or not. If you see a helicopter that's, uh, that's hovering right above you as you go across Whiskey Gulf, you may have done something wrong. So uh, a few strategies uh, and something that if the weather's good and you're heading north, um, I like going straight up the strait. Uh, it's the fastest route. It's not necessarily the most scenic, although there are pretty mountains on both sides of the Strait of Georgia, uh, but it's the quickest route and most direct route. So that can be a good option. And if you're traveling with the weather, um, so if you've got, you know, you're got heading north with, with a southerly wind, it's often not that uncomfortable and, and vice versa if you're heading south with a, a northerly wind. But it's also the most exposed. Um, and so what we, we typically do is um, we, we leave Nanaimo uh, with a plan to head to the next destination based on the weather forecast. Uh, and so we, we may go either Pender Harbor or Comox um, typically, or maybe all the way up to Campbell River depending on, on how good the weather is. Uh, and that decision is just made based on personal preference and, and weather. And so there's, there's not a right or a wrong answer. Um, I don't like beam seas, and so I, I would prefer head seas or following seas, and so that, that is what usually dictates the route that I take uh, up and down the Strait of Georgia. On the Desolation Sound cruise, are you, you guys still going up to Comox? Is that the plan? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Comox is a really cool spot. I'm glad you're going there. Um, and we'll talk on the return then about this alternate of coming down the Sunshine Coast. Uh, but the Sunshine Coast is beautiful. Uh, Princess Louisa Inlet up here, uh, well worth the visit. So here are some problem areas. Um, first area is Sandheads. That's right off Vancouver. There's little need for, for most American cruisers to be in that area. The problem is that you've got the Fraser River outflow uh, and that brings a bunch of sediment out. So you have to be way out in the middle of the strait anyway. Um, there's current from the Fraser River which can create wind against current situation. Um, generally, that whole area, if you're not keeping a boat up the Fraser River, there's no need to be over there. The next trouble spot is Qualicum Beach. Um, and that, what, what we see here is Port Alberni. That's uh, open to Barkley Sound on the west side of Vancouver Island. And there's a pass through there. Uh, and the wind can funnel through. And so it's not uncommon to hear that your, um, you know, 10 to, 10 to 20 knots of wind on the, on the Strait of Georgia, except for 20 to 30 offshore from Qualicum. Uh, and so that's, that's a, a pretty typical thing. If that's the case, um, then it's normally fairly short-lived, but you can also hug the shore on Vancouver Island or you can go around um, to the shoreline on the, the other side and you get protection from Texada Island. The other problem area, and this is seldom a problem in the summer, except for when there's southerly weather, is Cape Mudge. Um, and Cape Mudge in northerly weather is no problem at all, but when you get a southerly, uh, kind of a southerly storm and a flood current, you get really nasty uh, currents converging there and standing waves, and so it's some place to be avoided. I mention this primarily because you may be in Desolation Sound, thinking about heading around to Campbell River. Um, ordinary summer weather, there's nothing to worry about, but if you're, you're getting, um, you know, southerly, stronger southerly weather, there's all this fetch from uh, the Strait of Georgia uh, from the south, and so you just want to be careful at Cape Mudge. So that's the, the end of the Strait of Georgia um, PowerPoint, but I'm going to switch over now to uh, a internet browser tab, and then I'm going to show you uh, how we actually pull all this information right now. And we're going to decide if, if today would be a good day on the Strait of Georgia or not. All right. So, by the way, a lot of these these segments are uh, they're webinars on our website on Slowboat. So you go to the webinars tab. Um, they're there, but we'll click on the crossing the Strait of Georgia. 
uh, version. Let's see if this will load. And you can watch the video, or I'm going to scroll down. And what we've created here are weather worksheets. Um, these have the pertinent weather reporting sites that you'd be looking at. Um, the forecast zones we've got south of Nanaimo uh, down here, north of Nanaimo is this, this environment Canada forecast zone. Um, each of these is a, an important weather reporting site. The backside, or, or you can print these out um, so you can fill in you know, as you're, you're listening to it on the, the continuous marine forecast. The point of this is we, we like people to build a picture. So, um, you know, if it, you might have a good forecast and it might not be blowing at, at point E, but if you look at the weather and it's blowing like stink at F and B, um, you might not want to go across the Strait of Georgia. And so this, uh, this exercise forces you to look at the big picture and, and see uh, kind of across the board what the conditions are like. And so now we're going to click on some of these links and we're going to look at the forecast first. And then we're going to look um, at the, the actual conditions. So first, forecast zone, Strait of Georgia south of Nanaimo. And here we can see wind northwest 5 to 10 knots, becoming light this evening. Today sounds pretty good. Uh, tomorrow morning, not as good. So today on the forecast, looks really good. Looking ahead, most days look decent. Maybe not great, but decent. Here is the north of Nanaimo area. And 5 to 15 becoming light, increasing like tomorrow. OK, tomorrow afternoon, southeast 20 to 30, not so good. So tomorrow is probably not a great day. Uh, increasing in the morning, it doesn't sound ideal. But today sounds pretty nice. So now let's see if we'd actually want to go um, today. So we, the forecast is good. How is it actually looking out there? And so we're going to first look down here and click on weather conditions, light stations reports. And then you kind of got to decode this. This is uh, not the easiest information to use. And the time, there are a couple of important things here. The time is in UTC. Um, so make sure you're adjusting for that so you know what time this report was given. And then we're going to scroll down and we can see that Chrome Island, Mary Island, Entrance Island. So Entrance Island is the one right outside of Nanaimo. That's showing, according to the Lightkeeper, 14 knots, two foot chop. That's bumpy, but not terrible. That's probably a go, but it's gonna, you're going to feel it. But the other two out in the straight sound pretty good. One foot chop. Um, you can see one foot chop at Chrome Island. Mary Island sees rippled. Not much wind. Today would be a go for me. Um, but I'd probably check a couple more things first. I'd go back up to the current conditions. I'd check the weather buoy here. That's Halibut Bank. So we see it's west 12 knots, guessing 13 knots. You want to check this timestamp too. You want to make sure it's recent and we're not looking at old data. We could check the trend by going in the 24 hour conditions. And we can look through. Uh, and see, okay, is the weather in wind increasing? Is it decreasing? It looks like it's building a little bit in the afternoon. Then we're going to look at one more site, and that's windy.com. And here we are, and we're going to zoom in on our route. And there are a few tips here. First of all, change it from showing wind to wind gusts. We find that the, the wind gusts are a much more accurate representation of what conditions are likely to be. So switch it to wind gusts. Uh, and then make sure you know which of the models you're looking at. And so you've got down here at the bottom, you've got the NAM model. You got the ECM, WF, and the GFS. And look how different the weather looks on each of those models. Um, the ECM, WF is, is out of Europe, and I found that they're the most accurate typically, but not always. So I tend to look at them all and go based on the worst case situation. But we're going to stick with the ECM, WF, looking at wind gusts, 
Um, and this is showing right now, it's set, predicting that the gust would be 16 knots. And that's pretty close to what we're seeing when we looked at the, the weather conditions. Um, the weather conditions here were 12 gusting 13. Um, when we looked at the light station at Entrance Island, uh, Northwest 14. So, so that's all aligning. That's good. I like to see it uh, align. It'd be concerning if we were seeing really different uh, values from the predictions. And then I like to step through kind of every few hours and see how the conditions are, are looking like they might change. So like this, the Strait of Georgia today looks like it's going to stay pretty consistent until evening and then it calms down. So if I were sitting in Nanaimo right now, um, I would have no problem leaving and heading across the Strait of Georgia. Um, the forecast is that the weather is only going to get better today uh, or stay the same. Conditions right now are pretty good. And so it'd be a pretty much a, a no-brainer that I think that'd be a, a good day to go across. Now, um, this also allows you to plan your trip uh, more further in advance. And so let me give you an example from last summer. We left San Juan Island thinking we were going to be uh, first night in Nanaimo, next night crossing the Strait of Georgia, uh, and on and on because we're heading up to Alaska. Well, I was blown 2530 the whole time in the Strait of Georgia, and we didn't want to go out. Uh, in the strait in that weather. And so we decided instead of rushing up to Nanaimo on day one, we just, it looked like we were going to have three or four days of this wind. And so we were looking, looking ahead like this, you know, every day. Okay, that day is not looking great. This day is not looking great. Um, okay, here's a day. Tuesday looks good. So, so rather than rushing to Nanaimo today, um, let's slow down and let's enjoy the Gulf Islands for the next couple of days. And let's get into Nanaimo on Monday, um, spend our one night in Nanaimo and then jump across on Tuesday morning. And that's what we did. We ended up spending four days extra in the Gulf Islands. It was wonderful. We got to see a bunch of places we wouldn't have otherwise seen. And um, it was a lot better than, than rushing up to, to Nanaimo, sitting still for, for three days and everybody um, getting antsy and wanting to go even when the weather wasn't being super cooperative. Um, so th that to me is one of those things that is kind of a, a no brainer, but it's hard to get, uh, it's hard to get the flexibility and that flexible mindset sometime into, in, to people um, as they're, they're heading off on a, on a bigger trip, especially if they, this is the first trip, you've got all these, these plans, um, you want to get to desolation and, and I just want to get there, um, but, but don't do anything crazy that's going to, Kind of be uncomfortable uh, when there's another day that's better not too far out. So people have questions. I've lost my questions tab, but I'm going to find it, and then um, we can we can answer some questions. Then then move on to to anchoring. I think in terms of advantages of windy over predict wind, I don't have a, a strong preference. I've used windy more. I like its user interface a little bit more, but that's totally a, a personal preference. Uh, thing. So I've used predict wind a fair bit as well. Um, they predict wind runs their own modeling on top of the, the models that the ECMWF and, and, um, and NOAA provide. So they claim they're more accurate, but I don't have enough um, personal experience with it to, to tell you if that's true or not. I'd, I'd choose whichever one over, you know, windy predict wind and, and there are a half dozen more. I would choose the one that suits you the best. All right, we're gonna talk about anchoring. And I need to share my screen again. Anchoring tends to cause a lot of anxiety but it, um, once you get it and, and practice a few times, and I think, I think all of you will get it, we'll talk about the technique here, but it's a wonderful thing, um, having the view changing constantly, not having any neighbors that, that can peek into your boat um, and being free to, to go wherever you want is, is pretty awesome. So a couple of things that we have to clear up right away. Uh, the anchor isn't the most important part about this. The technique is far more important than the anchor. And so don't worry, uh, if you have a Bruce anchor, a Delta anchor, a Rockna anchor, or whatever, um, most of them will do just fine. And, and the, the anchor that comes with your Ranger Cutwater 
um, will do just fine for, for this, this kind of a trip. Uh, anchor selections like religion or politics. It is, people are extremely opinionated and uh, there's no convincing a lot of people about what type of anchor to use. Um, so I'll let, let you do that individually. I will say I've had, had good luck with, uh, with Manson Supreme and Rachna, um, but, and, and Delta and Bruce for that matter. So, so use this technique and I think you'll, you'll do just fine. It is important to have some, some chain on the, um, on the anchor road. And so the anchor road is the, the whole thing, the combination of line and chain. Um, larger boats, and you'll hear, if you talk to, to larger boat people, they'll poo-poo combination roads. I don't think there's any problem with a combination road. Uh, I think that they work just fine and, and they're the uh, best option for you know, most boats under 40 feet or so. Um, but be prepared to anchor in about 70 feet of water. That's, that's probably the deepest that you'll um, need to be anchoring in. And don't think that you're gonna be anchoring on seven to one scope either. Um, you're gonna more often than not be anchored on three to one. We'll talk about that more in a minute. It is critically important that you mark the length um, of your anchor road. You know how much you're paying out. And there are a lot of different strategies for this. You can buy um, little, little bits that insert into the chain links. You can buy pieces that um, you un, kind of untwist the, the line and you feed a thing in that's, that has the marker on it, number on it. Um, I personally use colored zip ties and I just write down what the color scheme is. You know, uh, pink means 50, blue means 100, whatever it is. Make sure you know your code. A lot of people like using paint, uh, spray paint. I find it a mess, the, the paint flakes off plus just applying it on the dock as a pain, you know, you gotta, um, you gotta protect the dock. And, and so that's a bit of a hassle. The zip ties are a lot easier uh, and you can reapply them when they, they break off easily. So if anybody else has a, a brilliant idea for marking the length of the, the anchor road, chime in. Uh, finally, secure the bitter end of the, the anchor road to the boat. Um, there should be a way to, to tie it into the anchor locker and there is nothing worse than watching the bitter end of your, your anchor line uh, pirouette off the bow roller, never to be seen again. So make sure it's tied off. That way, if you pay out all the, the line, you won't be surprised. So here's a technique that I like. And I mentioned Chapman's earlier. And uh, Chapman's will say that you should use 7 to 10 to 1, something like that. And that might be true in the East Coast where you're anchoring and in fairly shallow water, but when we're anchoring here in the Northwest, we're often in 40 to 70 feet. Uh, if we were all anchoring on three to one, it just wouldn't work. There's just not room for everybody, not to mention you would potentially swing into shore. So um, three to one is what we use, and, and uh, I have anchored hundreds of nights on three to one and never had, had any problem. So if you can't get it to set on three to one, then, then try four to one or five to one, but don't go right to seven to one or 10 to one. And what do I mean by this? It's the amount of line compared to the depth of the water. So you're gonna, you're gonna start um, with the depth of the water, say you're, you're in 50 feet of water. So you're gonna wanna then add um, a little bit to that because you've got some freeboard, you've got the tide change. Um, so you need to know where you are in the, the, the tidal cycle, if you're top or bottom. You've got potentially a little bit of offset because the depth transducer is measuring from below the water line. So I tend to add, um, you know, maybe add 10 feet or so to whatever the sounder is reading. This is not an exact science. This is much art as science. So don't worry if you're, you know, if your number that you come up with is eight feet or 15 feet, um, it probably won't make any difference. But I tend to, to, you know, say I'm gonna go take the depth of water, add about 10 feet, multiply by three, and that's gonna be the amount of anchor road that I pay out. But I don't just pull into the anchorage and do this. I, I pull in um, and I stop the boat. And that's really important. When you pull the, the throttle to neutral, the boat doesn't stop. There's a lot of inertia at play. And so the boat's gonna keep moving forward. Uh, you're gonna need to put the boat in reverse and that's gonna stop the boat. You're looking for that speed, speed over ground number on your chart plotter to drop down to something like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, um, 0 0.4. 
certainly less than, than half a knot. So once you've, uh, you've stopped where you want your anchor to be, um, you kind of above it, and then you're gonna lower uh, enough anchor road that it touches the bottom. So you wanna drop it, um, you're gonna be in, say you're in, in uh, 50 feet of water, we're gonna add 10 feet, so it's gonna be, we're gonna do um, 60 feet or so. So let's, let's drop 60 feet of anchor road and then very slowly start backing up. I like backing up towards shore. Some people will try to keep the bow pointed into the wind this entire time uh, or into the current. And that's a little bit of a fool's errand because um, the, the wind may shift, but it's hard to get the boat to back um, away from the wind. Most boats like to back into the wind. So the boat's naturally gonna, gonna spin around and back the opposite direction that you want. So don't worry so much uh, if the boat is facing the right direction uh, when you're anchored. When you're anchored, the boat needs to be, you know, it's gonna face all directions throughout the, the time. And so you need to be ready for that. But I like, I like setting the anchor by uh, backing or reversing toward the nearest obstacle. Because I know if I can't hit the nearest obstacle in reverse, then the wind's not gonna make me hit it either. The current's not gonna make me hit it either. Um, but you wanna do this really slowly and you wanna back up um, as you're continuing to pay out anchor road. And so the idea behind this is that you don't want to just drop all the anchor road on top of the anchor. Something might get tangled up and the anchor might not set. So you're gonna slowly reverse. And I don't mean just putting the thing in gear and, and going backwards. I mean, bumping the engine in and out of reverse. This is a, an under one knot exercise. Um, once you have, in this case, we were in 50 feet of water. We said we were gonna add 10 feet, so 60 feet. So we're gonna put 180 feet total. Uh, of anchor road into the water. Once we've deployed all 180 feet, then we are gonna tie the anchor road off. And that's important. Your windlass isn't designed to take 100% uh, of that load when you're setting the anchor and spending the night at anchor. So tie the anchor line off, and then you need to set the anchor. And to do that, you're gonna continue reversing, you know, bumping the boat in and out of gear, uh, eventually you're going to leave the boat in reverse and the boat's not going to be going backwards. If the boat's still going backwards, um, your anchor is not set. And, and when you feel that you'll feel the boat stop, um, the boat will be in reverse. Your chart plotter will be showing that you're not, you know, you're going 0.1 knot or zero knot, maybe 0.2 knots. Um, you will not see a wake, you know, from your anchor road. And, and so you'll, You'll feel the boat stopped. Leave it here for a minute in reverse and just let it let it hang. Um, then, then you're here. Um, I like to leave tracking on on the chart plotter. And so when you see something like this, the banana or the smiley face, um, that's your boat swinging at anchor. And that's normal in the wind. Um, this, this other one, this is a different night. And um, I had, I had, you know, the wind was one direction. I had swung this way a little bit, then the wind shifted and I swung a bunch over here. And so when I say that, don't worry so much if your anchor, uh, if your anchor is, is pointed, you're, if your bow is pointed in the right direction when you're anchoring, that's because the wind may shift, the current may shift, and you really, uh, you can't, you can't plan for all that. So your anchor, you have to trust that it will reset. Uh, and they, they do reset quite well. So look for this. Now, if I was anchored here, for instance, and it was blowing, like I think this day it was, and suddenly I noticed that I'm beyond this, this nice smiley face area or banana, then I'd know that the anchor dragged. Um, and if I'm still moving, then it would be, okay, I need to pull this anchor up and figure out what's happening. Um, you know, is it, is, did it wrap around kelp? Is it really rocky bottom that doesn't offer good holding? Who knows what it might be, uh, but in any case, I'd want to figure out why. Good question I just see about a trip line or buoy. Um, I'm not a big fan of trip lines or buoys, and we're going to talk more in a few minutes about other methods for, for retrieving a stuck anchor. My biggest problem with the, the trip line or the buoy is that you have uh, one more line in the water, it's more to deal with, um, more stuff to get your running gear caught in. And thankfully, I haven't needed 
a, a trip line and I don't know many people who have, but um, let's revisit that again in a few minutes. Somebody asked earlier about stern tying and what is it? Uh, and this is, is an example of stern tying. This is at a place called Teeker and Arm in Desolation Sound. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. But Teeker and Arm is a beautiful spot, but you can see there's no room to swing here. There's a cliff there. There's a cliff that you can't quite see in the frame here. Um, so if I was just anchored normally, or if this boat was just anchored normally in this situation, um, and the wind came from the wrong direction, which it probably would at some point, you'd, you'd blow into the rocks. Um, so the stern tying prevents swinging, and this is useful in crowded anchorages, whether it's the rocks crowding you or uh, another bunch of boats, which is the, the reality in desolation sound a lot of the summer. Or uh, the, other, the other thing is um, in very steep two anchorages, sometimes if you swung away from shore uh, and the wind came up, it would drag the anchor into water that's too deep. Um, whereas if you are uh, anchored near shore, it's shallow enough that, that the anchor can, can set. Um, here's my crude drawing of this. You've got the steep to shoreline. Um, you know, the anchor can be dragged, is not gonna be dragged up this hill, right? The anchor is gonna have forever more holding power as it gets dragged into shallower water because the scope is only become more, more and more um, shallow and the anchor is gonna have more holding power. Um, now, if we drag the other way, um, away from shore in this particular instance, that could be problematic because the water might get deeper and that, that anchor might have less and less holding power. Um, the reality is that when we're stern tying, it's almost always in very protected, very calm anchorages. And so the, the wind doesn't, isn't much of an issue. Um, what you do need is to have a long line, something at least 200 feet long. Uh, I'm going to pause a moment. No, to answer that question, no, that drawing is not to scale. Uh, apologies, my, my art skills are, are weak. Uh, and this other question, oh, sh should the, the line be pulled off the roller assembly? Uh, no, it should not, typically. Uh, I'd leave it going over the roller and just tie it off to the cleat on the bow. Um, so, Yes, yeah, so humor is hard to, to uh, articulate sometimes on electronics. I have no, no audience to laugh back. Um, anyway, here's some examples of stern ties. And these run the gamut. This is a hose reel. Um, I've seen Ultra that come, makes some, some really beautiful reels for, for dealing with, with stern ties. They're spendy though. Uh, so, I never, I never opted for a fancy one, but you, but you may decide that uh, if you're going to be in desolation sound and, and in these kind of anchorages a lot, it's worthwhile. But at least a couple hundred feet of inexpensive polypropylene, that's that, that kind of floating yellow line. It doesn't have to be very strong, but it needs to be on some kind of a reel. That makes it a lot easier to pay out and retrieve. And so what you typically do is you drop the hook like normal, you back the boat towards shore, and then you've got to get somebody to shore, um, either in a dinghy or a kayak, uh, swimming if it's, if it's really, uh, if they're adventurous. But you got to take the bitter end of that line, uh, take it to shore, and preferably wrap it around something and bring it back to the boat. With, um, that way you don't have to go back to shore when you retrieve it. If you don't have a long enough line, uh, you can do it one way, but then you have to crawl back up to shore uh, to get it undone when, when you're through. Keep in mind that when you're doing this, you're going to be crawling up, um, you know, some shorelines that's rocky and maybe slippery. Um, and there might be a lot of sharp little muscles and, and barnacles and whatnot. So do, do be careful about, um, about that and, and be really cautious about your footing. The other advantage to looping it back to the boat is that you can, uh, you, the tide will likely be different when you're leaving. And so you may not be able to reach easily uh, the, the tree or whatever, or rock or, or loop that you used on uh, when, you, when you set up the, the tie the first time. If you're cruising with other people um, and you're rafting up, not every boat needs to run a stern tie. Uh, you could have one boat run a stern tie um, and several other boats could raft on. You could also have one person uh, be in a dinghy and set up a bunch of different stern ties. 
Uh, so we've done, we used both those techniques in the past. Oh, so here's a, a comment that, that somebody said that we do two people in the dinghy. One man's the dinghy, the other climbs up shore uh, to do the tree or the rock. That, that's a great idea as well. Um, if it's if it's calm enough that you can pull the boat in with the dinghy. If it's a little bit breezier, that sometimes you need somebody on the boat to keep it kind of oriented in the right direction. Occasionally, uh, anchors get stuck on the bottom. Uh, not often, but it happens. And, and there's a lot of industry logging and, and such that's happened in these places in the past. There are boats that are sunk on the bottom. Um, I pulled up electrical cables and logging cables and stuff. And so if you are, if, you, if your anchor's not coming back up, um, this kind of thing happens, then a trip line can help because you can pull, uh, this is a rock to anchor, and you can see how you normally pull the anchor from, um, you know, it's the end of its shank. But you can also, uh, a trip line to be rigged from the, the opposite end of the anchor, and then you can kind of pull it from the, the other end. Another, another option um, is if you can run a large shackle or a length of chain um, down the whole anchor ridge. So say you get, say your anchor gets stuck on the bottom, um, you've pulled in all the slack, so now you're sitting just with basically uh, a little more than the depth of the water in terms of the anchor road deployed. If you put a big shackle around that anchor road or chain with a line attached to it, um, and then you slide, you, you slide that down the anchor chain or line, um, and then you pull that line that's attached to that shackle that you just slid down from the opposite direction that you've been pulling the rest of the, the time, you might have a chance of, of unsticking that anchor. Um, so there are various strategies. You, you know, you'd have to use another boat or a dinghy or something to pull on that from a different angle. But that is one method for trying to, to retrieve an uh, a stuck anchor. Um, to answer the question about the, the diameter of the polypro, I think three eighths would be would be plenty for um, most of these situations and most most of these boats. Some of the really small stuff, the, the biggest hassle is just a pain to work with. It's so tiny, it kind of um, it it it's hard to grab and hard to tie knots in. So good equipment to have. I think almost all of these boats have windlasses. If you are anchoring a lot, a washdown system for the anchor makes sense. It's, it's some of these places come back with lots of mud. Um, and then it's nice to be able to wash it off so that the anchor locker doesn't get stinky. Um, wash, wash down with, with raw water is fine. Obviously, you're not going to be using fresh water. Then some people, myself included, carry a whole spare anchor and anchor road. I've been doing this now for, for eight years and, and um, you know, 30 something thousand nautical miles through here, hundreds of nights at anchor, and I've yet to use my, my spare anchor and road. So I hope it stays that way. Um, I, so I wouldn't go out and buy one for a trip to Desolation Sound, but it is something to be aware of. The, the beauty of Desolation Sound is that you can, uh, there's a, you can always uh, find nearby a, a marina or a dock of some type to tie up at if, if for whatever reason you were to lose your anchoring gear. So a question about um, connecting the chain to the anchor shank maybe with, with heavy duty zip ties. I think the theory behind that, and correct me if I'm wrong, would, would be that the zip ties would break um, with enough force and then pull the anchor from a different angle. My concern with that would be um, that it would also, and when you need your anchor to hold most, would also be um, when the zip ties would potentially break so unless these zip ties are really engineered to break with a certain, uh, you know, a, a certain force, I, I don't think it would be a good idea. Ah, is it ever advantageous to triangulate with two anchors? Um, I have not seen this method used much in the Northwest. I've heard about it used in other areas where there's swell coming into an anchorage and you don't, you know, you want to keep the bow pointed in one direction, for instance. But we haven't we haven't seen it used widely in the Northwest, so I I wouldn't worry about that um, uh, on a typical trip to Desolation. The other thing with a stern tying, if you in a place like Credo Haven, if you want to be in one of the shallow spots close to shore, you'd likely need to stern tie. But if you're willing to anchor out in, in 70 or 80 feet of water out in the middle, there's seldom any need to stern tie. So um, there are almost always alternatives to stern tying. Uh, if, if you don't want to do do that process. All right, well, I think we'll uh, 
uh, I can keep it, you know, if you, if, if you have more questions as we continue, I'll answer them. Uh, but I'm going to dive into destinations in, uh, in Desolation Sound, the, the most fun, and then getting home and getting let back into the United States or for Canadians getting let into the uh, United States.